thank you so much. It's wonderful to join you here today. And what I'm proposing to do is to set out some of the history of my battle for LGBT plus rights in Britain. And then we'll have a discussion and you'll be open and able to participate. So I guess my starting point was that when I was growing up as a teenager, male homosexuality in Britain was totally illegal. It was punishable by a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. You could be jailed for life for having sex with another man. There were, of course, no laws against sex between women. But male homosexuality was penalised and very severely penalised at that. Now, there were police raids on people's private homes. Um, and the tactic the police would use is to seize your address book. And they'd go through your address book and look at your telephone records and they would then hunt down every person, every male person, in your address book and your telephone record in a bid to pressure them to confess so they could then be prosecuted. It was like a police state. Now, of course, not every gay and bisexual man was targeted. That would have been physically impossible, given the numbers. But all of us lived in fear of the policeman's knock on the door. You know, there were very few gay bars in those days and hardly any gay clubs anywhere in Britain. And those that did often had to pay off the police so they could operate. But they were still under constant threat of being raided. And back in those days, two men holding hands or dancing together, that was deemed a crime. And you could get arrested if the police raided a bar or club and caught you. Just for simply dancing with another man or holding his hand. And then we had the medical profession and the psychiatric profession, which in those days declared that homosexuality was a sickness, an illness that needed treatment. And so what this treatment involved and this continued right up until the mid-1970s, this treatment involved what was called aversion therapy. What was done was, if you were gay, and if you were ordered by the courts, or maybe a gay young person and pressured by your family, you'd be taken to a hospital, a National Health Service hospital, funded by the taxpayer, where you'd be strapped into a chair, have electrodes applied to parts of your body, and then shown images, erotic images, of men. And every time one of those images appeared, you'd be given an electric shock. An alternative method was to strap the person in a bed and then inject them with nausea-inducing drugs to make them vomit, urinate, and defecate. And as this was happening, they'd be shown sexy images of men. The logic of this aversion therapy was to create an association in a gay person's mind that gay sex was unpleasant, painful, and to be avoided. It was an absurd unscientific theory that did not work. I had a friend of mine who, through his family and church, was pressured to undergo aversion therapy. It didn't cure him, but it made him impotent. In other words, he couldn't get sexually aroused, he couldn't have sex, and he recalled in horror at any kind of intimate contact with another man. He was young when this happened. His whole life was ruined. And this was done by the British Medical Establishment. The British Medical Association, 
the forerunners of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, they agreed and sanctioned this kind of medical abuse. Then if we look at the churches and other religious organizations, they all had a uniform view that homosexuality was sinful, immoral, unnatural, and abnormal. I can remember at my own church, the pastor denouncing homosexuality as if it was akin to murder or rape. That was the mentality back then in the 1960s. And of course in schools, there was no sex education for anyone, let alone LGBTI people. I never received a single lesson in sex and relationships. So you can imagine, even for heterosexual young people, life was difficult in terms of understanding about sex and relationships, about how to have happy, healthy, fulfilling sex and relationships, because no instruction was given at all. It wasn't until 1969, when I was 17, that I realised I was gay. This was in my hometown of Melbourne, Australia. At that time, there were no gay organisations, not even any helplines or counselling services. There was absolutely nothing. So growing up in those circumstances was incredibly isolating. You felt incredibly alone and vulnerable. There were no role models. There were no public figures who were openly gay. Not one. No pop stars, no actors, actresses, no politicians. Nobody in public life was openly gay. So there was no reference point. But I had already been aware of other social issues prior to realising that I was gay. I'd been inspired by the black civil rights movement in the United States, by the way in which African Americans challenged racial segregation in the Deep South and the denial of voting rights to black people. And I saw in the tactics of Martin Luther King and others, the tactics of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience, I saw those tactics as inspirational. I saw them as a model of how to do campaigning in an era when people in power were totally rejecting of LGBT issues and rights. So that was my template. And I worked out in my own mind at the age of 17, if black people are a persecuted, oppressed minority, then so too are LGBT plus people. We too are also victims of an oppressive state and society. I concluded that just like black people in America, we too had a legitimate claim for dignity, respect and equal rights. So the black civil rights movement became my template. And when I came to London in 1971, because I objected to Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War, where terrible crimes against humanity were being committed by the Americans and other allied forces. I was not prepared to be drafted. I faced the prospect of two years in prison if I maintained my refusal, so I fled the country and came to London. I arrived in London not long after the formation of the Gay Liberation Front, the first really mass public movement of LGBT plus people in this country. This was a movement whose slogan was, gay is good. We borrowed that idea from the black civil rights movement in America. They said black is beautiful, and we agreed, so our slogan was, gay is good. To challenge the orthodoxy which said that gay was bad, mad and sad. And we organised protests to challenge the homophobia, biphobia and transphobia that was all around us. In those days, you couldn't get a debate in Parliament about removing anti-gay laws. In those days, people in government would not meet with LGBT organisations 
So we had to follow the example of the black civil rights movement and use the tactic of non-violent direct action and civil disobedience. So I can remember just three months after I arrived, we discovered that lots of pubs and bars in London refused to serve LGBT plus people. Just like some refused to serve Irish people or black people in those days. And we said, we're not having this. We're not having this discrimination. So we copied the tactics of the black civil rights movement. You remember, in the 1960s, Martin Luther King and others led black people to sit in at lunch counters that refused to serve black people, to swim in beaches that were reserved for white people only, to ride in the part of the bus or the train that was designated whites only. So we used the same tactics. We went to these pubs and demanded to be served as LGBT plus people. They refused. We staged a sit-in. They called the police. We were arrested. This went on and on and on. But after a few weeks, we made it clear we're not going away. We'll come back every week or every night if necessary until you serve us. And the owners of those bars and clubs eventually relented because, not because they agreed or supported us, but because we were financially ruining their business. We were turning other customers away. So they gave in for the wrong reasons, but they did give in. So there's a good example of how the LGBT plus movement has learned from the black movement. And that's very, very important. We can all learn from each other. We can look at history and see examples of how marginalized, disadvantaged communities have fought and won their freedom. And we can apply that to our own issues, our current issues today. Another great protest I remember being involved in was also in late 1971, the Gay Liberation Front joined with the Women's Liberation Movement in staging a protest outside the Miss World contest, which was held at the Royal Albert Hall in London. We were saying this contest objectified women, treated them as sex objects, demeaned and humiliated them. We demand that women be treated with respect. So we ringed the entire circumference of the Royal Albert Hall, and the Gay Liberation Front staged an alternative Miss World contest on the pavement outside. These were men in drag, and instead of, you know, Miss United Kingdom or Miss Thailand or whatever, our contestants were called misused, mistreated, misrepresented, and so on, to signal the way in which we saw women being denigrated by this contest and the wider sexism of society. In the 1980s, I was involved in many, many attempts to get LGBT rights debated in Parliament. But you couldn't get it. Politicians and government were not even willing to discuss the issue. They said it was so disgusting, it was unfit for Parliament to even talk about. And this was at a time when Britain had a raft of anti-gay laws, not just the criminalization of sex between men, but many other laws banning same-sex marriage, banning fostering and adoption by same-sex couples, <coughs> refusing to allow LGBT plus people in the armed forces, and so on, and so on, and so on. They would not even let a parliamentary debate happen. That's how homophobic the House of Commons was, even in the 1980s. So among other things, this led to the formation of Outrage in 1990, which I co-founded with about 30 other people. Outrage was sort of a revival of the Gay Liberation Front. Again, modelled on not only the Black Civil Rights Movement, but the suffragettes and before them the Chartists. We again decided that if Parliament won't debate these issues, 
we have to challenge Parliament. So we did direct action. We did non-violent civil disobedience. So, for example, in those days, it was illegal to march on Parliament. You could be arrested if you tried to march within a mile radius of Parliament. So we decided we were going to march anyway to demand the repeal of anti-gay laws. And the police blocked our way. We sat down and we were all arrested en masse. That campaign made headlines in Britain and around the world. It shone a spotlight on the scale of homophobia that not only were these anti-LGBT plus laws on the statute books, but Parliament wouldn't even allow us to march to the House of Commons to make our representation. In the 1990s, every time there was a state opening of Parliament, when the Queen went there, we stood outside with simple placards. Repeal anti-gay laws. Legislate LGBT plus equality. Every time we were arrested, because the police said, your presence in those placards are offensive. They arrested us on a charge of breach, behaviour likely to cause a breach of the peace. In other words, the police were saying, your placards may offend a bigoted homophobic person and they may come and attack you. Therefore, you are responsible for their behaviour because you've held this placard, we're arresting you. They never arrested the bigots who threatened and assaulted us, sometimes. They arrested us for simply asking for LGBT plus equality. And this was in the, this continued until the late 1990s, until we eventually brought an action which resulted in that ban being overturned. And that's why now you can protest in Parliament Square. It's because outraged myself and our colleagues, we were all arrested in challenging that ban in the 1990s. We saw extra parliamentary protest, that is, protest outside of Parliament to challenge Parliament as the key. And so it proved. Our direct action campaign initially did not change any laws, but it did get news coverage which helped raise public awareness about the scale of homophobic, biophobic and transphobic discrimination. So it's worth remembering that until 1999, Britain had by volume the largest number of anti-gay laws of any country in the world. Some of them dating back centuries. Yet here we are today and we have some of the best laws all within the space of two decades. That is the fastest, most successful law reform campaign in British history, and as far as I know, in world history. I can't think of another country or another set of laws that have been repealed in such a short space of time as all those anti-gay laws. Of course, the first law that went was the ban on LGBT plus people in the armed forces. And that was the result, not of our parliament, but of four courageous service personnel bringing a case to the European Court of Human Rights, which ruled in 1999 that banning LGBT people from the armed forces or sacking them from the military if they're already enlisted, that that was unjust, unlawful discrimination under the European Convention on Human Rights. And that forced the Labour government, to end the ban. A couple of years later, in 2001, the European Court also ruled that the age of consent that was discriminatory had to be equalised. So, you know, in 1967, when there was a partial limited decriminalisation of male homosexuality, the age of consent for sex between men was set at 21, whereas it was, whereas it was 16 for men and women. And then in 1994, Parliament reduced it to 18 as the age of consent for sex between men, while keeping it at 16 
for heterosexual men and women. So it's still discrimination. And that final discrimination ended in shortly afterwards when the European Parliament ruled that that discriminatory age of consent of 18 was unlawful and it required the Labour government to equalise the age of consent at 16 for everyone, regardless of sexuality. Since then, there have been so many other laws. You know, it's now legal for same-sex couples to foster and adopt children. First we had civil partnerships, then same-sex marriage. Uh, we ended the notorious Section 28. Section 28, for 15 years, forbade schools from even discussing LGBT plus issues. It said you cannot, pro, quote, promote homosexuality or promote homosexuality or same-sex relations as, quote, a pretended family relationship. In effect, it meant any objective teaching about LGBT plus issues was deemed promotion. And therefore, schools across the country just stopped any discussion of LGBT plus issues, leaving tens of thousands of LGBT plus kids without affirmation, without support, and continued to be subjected to bullying in school. There is, of course, more to do. And also, we need to recognize that LGBT rights are not in isolation. In my work, I've always seen LGBT plus rights as part of the wider, broader human rights movement and striven to build links with the women's movement, with black and ethnic minority organizations, with disabled groups, with persecuted faith minorities, with people who, for whatever reason, are marginalized and outside the mainstream. Because I've always believed that oppression, wherever you find it, it's all interconnected. There's a common thread, a common thread of prejudice and discrimination. And we should therefore all work together, because together we are stronger. And if I can support you and you can support me, collectively we have a greater chance of success. So going back to the early days of the Gay Liberation Front, I can remember when, in, I think it was 1971, nine very prominent black activists were, well, I think, quote, framed by the police on false charges. They were put on trial. The Gay Liberation Front thought, we have to be there to support them. And in fact, we were the only non-black organization to stand in solidarity outside the court that day because we believed that the struggle of black people and gay people, these were both important struggles and that we should help and show solidarity with each other. Later on, much later on, many of you will know that uh, twice, at the request of Zimbabwean human rights activists, I sought to challenge the regime of President Robert Mugabe. What a wonderful day it was this week when he finally resigned. But who will replace him? Is the new president any better? His record is not good. He too, the new president, his record of human rights abuses and the suppression of protests is just as bad as Mugabe. But maybe, maybe in this moment, he will change. And that's the hope. But I also feel both joy and sorrow because I think of the thousands of black Zimbabweans who were murdered by the Mugabe regime. In the region of Matabili land in the 1980s, an estimated 20,000 opposition supporters were massacred by Mugabe's army. 20,000. Some of you may have heard of the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa under apartheid in 1960, when thousands of black Africans marched in protest to the pass laws. The pass laws dictated where black South Africans could live and work. This was a, 
police state control. They march peacefully against the past laws and the South African apartheid police opened fire on them and shot dead 69 people. The world was horrified. The world was horrified. But in Matabili land, President Mugabe committed the equivalent of a Sharpeville massacre every single day for more than nine months. And yet most of the world looked the other way. Well, when I was asked to do something, I didn't look the other way. I said, yes, I want to support black and white Zimbabweans who are fighting for democracy and human rights. And I organized many protests outside the Zimbabwean High Commission in London and against members of the regime that visited London. But that wasn't really making an impact. So in, late, in the late 1990s, I hit on the idea of using the power of citizen's arrest to try and get Mugabe arrested and put on trial for human rights abuses. Under British law, any private citizen, including all of you, has the right to arrest someone if you have evidence that they have committed a crime. I had evidence that President Mugabe had personally authorised the torture of two black journalists in Zimbabwe, Ray Choto and Mark Chavanduka. I had the evidence from Amnesty International and from their own affidavits. This was the legal case to get President Mugabe put on trial in Britain. So then I had to wait for him to come to Britain. I can remember in late October 1999, I received a midnight phone call. The caller said simply, you might be interested to know that President Mugabe has arrived tonight from Paris. He's staying at the St. James's Court Hotel near Victoria. It's a private shopping trip he's doing at Harrods. He leaves on Saturday night at 6 p.m. from Heathrow. Before I could ask any question, the caller hung up. So my instinct was, is this a joke, a hoax, a wind-up? But the guy had clearly had an African accent, but even though it could have been a setup, I decided to assume it was genuine. So I, I knew that he had to leave on Saturday morning. He had to leave the hotel to get his flight at Heathrow at 6 p.m. So at some point, he'd have to leave the hotel. So my plan was to ambush him, to try and arrest him, either as he came down the steps of the hotel to get into his limousine, or if he drove out of the vehicle entrance. So I phoned around lots of people, will you help me arrest President Mugabe? I've never heard so many excuses in my life. I'm going away for the weekend. I've got a cold. Um, I've arranged to go to the theater. In the end, the only people I could find to help me were three other members of the LGBT group Outrage. Now, of course, Mugabe is homophobic, but we weren't doing that over his homophobia. We were trying to get him on a charge of torture, which is a crime under British and international law, and anyone who commits, authorizes, or condones torture in any country, if they step foot in Britain, they can be arrested and put on trial. So that was the legal basis of our action. Anyway, the only people I could get was three other members of Outrage. So we lay in wait outside his hotel from 8.30 in the morning on the Saturday, knowing he'd have to come out sometime. We tried looking conspicuous. Um, one of us stood at a bus stop reading a newspaper. Another was in a telephone bo booth pretending to make telephone calls. Uh, I was looking in shop windows. But hey, after two hours, it's hard to not look conspicuous. And indeed, after two hours, I noticed that the concierge of the hotel, the guy in the top hat and tails who greets VIP guests, came out on the steps and started looking at all of us. I noticed how his eyes were roving. He's clocking us all. I thought, <gasps> he's noticed we're here. He's, he must be suspicious. If Mugabe's in the hotel, he might alert the police or at least alert Mugabe's security. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, 
out from the vehicle entrance or exit came five or six African-looking guys who started looking and pointing at each of us. I thought, joy! This probably means that Mugabe is in the hotel and they are probably his security detail. Up until that point, it was all a huge gamble. But then I thought, oh, no. If they think we're a potential threat, either Mugabe won't come out or they will call the police and the whole plan will go upside down. So in those circumstances, it's really difficult to think hard. You know, while we were waiting there, it was a freezing cold day. You can see I'm quite skinny. I was shivering with the cold. I had a splitting headache from the nervous tension. My stomach was churning over and I needed to pee. But I knew if I went and found a toilet, sure enough, that would be the bad moment when he would come out and we'd miss him. So I had a copy of the Evening Standard in my uh, bag. So I rolled it into a cone shape and then discreetly stood in a, in a closed shop doorway and peed into it and then put it in a rubbish bin. Anyway, these, um, these five or six security guys came out, and um, it's really hard to think on your feet when you're in such incredible nervous tension. We, of course, we were afraid we would get beaten up by his bodyguards, arrested by the police, you name it. But suddenly I had a brainwave, so I strode across the road, straight to where these security guys were, smiling and beaming, holding out my hand to shake their hand, and said, hi guys, I'm from the news of the world, and these are my fellow journalists, my photographer, my video person. So we had, a, we had a journalist, a video person, and a photographer with us. Um, we've heard that Elton John is in the hotel with his new boyfriend. We've got to get photographs and a story for tomorrow's paper. Can you tell us which room he's in? They looked at me like, like I was mad. And I said, look, we had a tip-off that Elton's in this hotel. Now, come on, I'll give you 50 pounds if you tell us which room he's in. They shook their heads. I said, I'll give you 75 pounds. I'll give you 100 pounds. I only had 10 pounds in my pocket. <laughs> but they weren't buying it. Um, so then I, then I just turned to one of them and said, look, <laughs> you can't fool me. I know you. You are part of Elton John's security detail because I saw you at the Wembley concert two months ago. There was no Wembley concert two months previous. You wouldn't be here if Elton wasn't in the hotel. Come on, I'll give you £100. And this guy burst out laughing, and then he spoke to his colleagues in the Zimbabwean accents, Nebedeli or Shona. And they all burst out laughing, and they walked off. And I thought to myself, I think I might have convinced them. And sure enough, ten minutes later, out came President Mugabe in his limousine. I scratched the top of my head, to indicate to my colleagues up the street that he was in the car. And as it began to accelerate, they ran straight out in front of his speeding limousine. It screeched to a halt about six to nine inches from their legs. Then one of my colleagues ran behind the car so it couldn't move forward and couldn't move backward. I ran from the side and opened the rear car door. Amazingly, it was unlocked. And there before me was the president of Zimbabwe. I held out this hand to show I didn't have a weapon and then gently took Mugabe's arm with my right hand. I said, President Mugabe, you're under arrest on charges of torture. Torture is a crime under international law. I am now summonsing the police. You should have seen the look on his face. He is very dark skinned, but a visible ashen pallor came across his face. He recoiled back in his seat, his eyes popped, his jaw dropped. He held up his hands like a frightened 10-year-old child. And I remember thinking to myself, now you know what your victims feel like. And we aren't going to torture you or kill you. We're going to take you to a court of law and you will have a chance to defend yourself. So we summoned the police, Initially, only three officers arrived. They were absolutely gobsmacked when we said we had the president of Zimbabwe under arrest. Uh, we produced the papers, all the legal papers. They just knocked them out of our hands. 
summoned reinforcements. But while the reinforcements were coming, which took quite a while, the three police officers tried to remove us from the car. And we held onto the car, and, but it took two officers to remove us and put us on the pavement. Then they went back, get, back to get the next person. So the person on the pavement then ran back in front of the car again. <laughs> so there's cat and mouse going on for about 10 minutes until about 20 reinforcements arrived. And there we were very, very roughly and, well, I'd say quite violently removed by the police while President Mugabe was given a police escort to go Christmas shopping at Harrods. We spent nearly seven hours in the cells at Belgravia Police Station. The police tried to fit us up with a whole range of charges. When it came to the opening day of our trial, our defence barrister said, we have all the evidence on video film. We will show that 15 police officers are planning to commit perjury. The magistrate adjourned and five or ten minutes later announced that all charges were withdrawn. So we didn't face any charges. And I think one of the reasons, of course, is probably they didn't want it tested in a court of law that we had acted lawfully. That the power of citizens' arrest is a real thing because they thought there'd be more copycat attacks. And the copycat arrests. So people might try to arrest Tony Blair for war crimes in Iraq, or Benjamin Netanyahu for war crimes in Palestine, or George W. Bush for war crimes in Afghanistan. Um, we didn't succeed, but we did manage to get worldwide media coverage, which helped shine a light on the terrible human rights abuses that were happening in Zimbabwe at the time, and which at that moment, were not being much reported. The messages we received from people inside Zimbabwe, black and white, and we received thousands of them, almost all said the same thing. Thank you. We thought no one knew. We really appreciate that. We thought no one cared. So for people inside Zimbabwe, it was a great psychological and morale boost. And to this day, I think that attempt at citizen's arrest and the subsequent one I did in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel in Brussels in 2001, where I was actually beaten unconscious by his bodyguards, those, as far as I know, are the only two successful attempts to face-to-face -to -face confront Mugabe in all the 37 years that he had been in power. So I'm really proud that we could do something small, something not entirely successful, or not successful in terms of getting put on trial, but do something to show our solidarity with the enormous courage of Zimbabwean activists, tens of thousands of whom have been murdered, tortured, and killed. And even, you know, in prison, those political prisoners, and many of them were raped, gang raped, both male and female prisoners were gang raped by Mugabe's guards in prisons, starved to near death, and some did actually die, denied medical treatment. This is what his regime represents. Of course, he's just one of many tyrants and despots. But we do have a duty to wherever and whenever we can challenge those who violate the human rights of others, whether they be LGBT plus or any other person for any other reason. Whether it's Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, whether it's civil society activists in Russia, whether it's Black Lives Matter protesters in the United States, or whether it's Aboriginal activists in Australia and women's rights activists in Kenya. When we see them take a stand, we can and should support them. We should amplify their voices, publicize them, talk to our friends, tell the stories of their witness and their courage because that's the way social progress is made. When we stand up, when we stand up and challenge those who abuse their power and authority, that inspires and motivates others. And we collectively have enormous power and strength. 
The battle for LGBT plus rights in this country shows it. The state was intransigently homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic. Yet LGBT plus people and our straight friends and allies challenge that. And that's how we finally persuaded Parliament and the public to support LGBT rights. So I'll leave you with my motto, which is very simple. Don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen. Thank you.